Yes, yeah. Hi there, I'm here in Dowling. I'm a senior plant science major at uh, Cal Poly Pomona. We're standing here in the hydroponics greenhouse and growing hydroponic tomatoes. My name is Robin Reese. I'm in the agribusiness management program here at Cal Poly. I'm an undergraduate student and I'm also a worker here in these fantastic greenhouses. So this facility is about 4,000 square feet and dedicated to all tomatoes, uh, growing them hydroponically. So it's uh, coconut fiber and frequent irrigation schedules. The, uh, the coconut fiber is really a good example of uh, sustainability in agriculture as far as hydroponics is concerned. Now what we have here is the, the crushed remnants of the coconut plant and so for the coconut milk, coconut oil industry, which have been really large for a long time, they have all this residual material that's coming off and this has a great uh, cation exchange capacity. Holds, holds nutrients very well. Sorry holds nutrients, you. holds water, holds air, and it's uh, more or less pH neutral. You know, in the greenhouse here, we're also using this to substitute natural soil, which could uh, come with many different uh, negative bacteria in it that we want to avoid. And this kind of gives us a clean start, uh, sterility and more control over uh, nutrient and water cycling. Right, there's uh, absolutely no nutritive value to this and, uh, and like Kieran mentioned it's free of pathogens for the most part. They do, uh, they do sterilize it, they cook it up uh, for us before we plant in it. So it gives us the ability to really dial in the nutrients and only give the plant what it needs, nothing more. So you can control excess uh, runoff levels, uh, whereas in soil a lot of times you're going to have nitrates leaching through the root zone, a lot of wasted fertilizer. So everything that we put in here goes directly to the plants. Right, and you know, the whole concept of using what we can really pulls in with the greenhouse as well. I mean, as you can see in the weather outside, it's probably about 50 or 60 degrees out, and uh, we're, we're chilling here at about 75 at all times. So, heaters, uh, shading material, uh, constant airflow keeps the, the environment in here at constant uh, perfection. So as far as irrigation goes here, we use a drip irrigation system, which is cutting line. This technology was developed a couple decades back in Israel, and we're seeing a wide adaptation throughout agriculture. It's very cool in a hydroponic setting because the coconut fiber wicks moisture very effectively. So you can water in one particular spot, and it will carry that moisture, carry that nutrients evenly throughout the plant. We don't get any sort of uneven growth. We don't get any sort of uh, pathogens or rot, things like that. It also allows us to use only the minimum amount of water necessary. So in an outdoor setting, because of fertilizer issues, because of salt issues, water quality issues, a lot of times you're applying a certain amount of water to the land that is in excess of what your plant actually needs. In the hydroponic setting, it's only what the plant absolutely needs. So to take care of the fertility issues with the tomatoes here, we uh, tend to inject our nutrients with a concentration tank. And there's various calculations you can do on the exact quantity you need, but generally what we'll do is look up university data and find out what part per million of nutrient the tomato would need, and then you inject that through a siphoning system, kind of like this. All right, so in addition to being able to control the irrigation style and the climate in here, all these factors combine to significantly affect the growth rate of the plants here. So. Uh, as Kieran mentioned earlier, outside today, it's raining, it's probably in the high 50s. If we had a tomato plant out there, assuming no frost, it's going to be very limited in how fast it can grow. In here, because we can control a multitude of factors, we might get an inch, even two inches per day during the height of growing season. Additionally, we have these awesome trellis systems that allow us to pack a higher plant population per square foot into an area and grow them vertically, whereas outdoors, tomatoes are typically grown as a row crop with uh, a big amount of space so we can compact a lot of things into one square foot or square meter whatever your unit volume is for measuring that and significantly increase the yield per amount of space that we have and so that's really important for keeping the economics of a greenhouse operation viable right maintaining maximum yield per square foot is always a, a huge consideration in, in greenhouse production and you know these were planted maybe a month ago and and we're probably about two three weeks out from the next harvest so you know, maybe up here on the size of the trellis, it's hard to determine by inches per day, but uh, you know, very vigorous growers, yes. We, t we tend to keep them capped out at around eight feet or so. This provides a good working area for our, uh, our harvesters, allows us to keep good airflow throughout the plants and allows them to absorb the maximum amount of sunlight. All right, so the system of hydroponics that you see behind us is what's called nutrient film. 
It was inspired by the original hydroponic system, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And how this works is, rather than having a set root zone, like in a coconut fiber operation, each plant is in one system, all their roots commingle, and the way nutrients are transferred is through the ever constant flow of water from the central tank. By flowing uh, constantly, that's how we oxygenate the water rather than relying on a root zone and, and trickling through to incorporate dissolved oxygen into the system. One of the main differences in this is that because there is no root zone, no uh, root media to hold fertilizer, typically the fertilizer concentration is going to be a little bit higher. So we take care of the fertility aspect of the lettuce here with uh, specific ratios of uh, acid and fertilizer for our pH and electrical conductivity levels. Uh, like he was saying, lettuce likes a little bit of a higher feed, so we like to put it at about 2 EC, which comes out to 1,000 parts per million. And uh, being hydroponic, we like to be in the low fives for our pH as well. One of the main differences that you might notice if you were here in this greenhouse as opposed to the tomato greenhouse is that lettuce likes a slightly cooler environment. Typically outdoors, it is a cool season crop. So any excessive heat can cause it to bolt, to flower, and otherwise impart a bitter taste on to the product that we're trying to get to our customers. So we lower the temperature here, and we increase the humidity a little bit to reduce the evaporative stress on the plant itself. So as we were mentioning, uh, lettuce is a cool season crop, and to attain this in a greenhouse, we have these uh, system of shade cloths uh, installed where they automatically sense the amount of sunlight coming in as uh, joules of energy and can effectively uh, determine the amount of shade that needs to cool the house. Uh, if that's not enough during the summer months when it sometimes gets up to 100 degrees outside, we have a cooling cell in the back there that recirculates water through uh, we call a swamp pad and essentially brings our humidity up and brings the temperatures down. One of the cool aspects of producing lettuce in a greenhouse versus outside is the type of lettuce that we're able to grow here. Now outdoors, you have a focus on romaine or uh, crisp head lettuce, things that are dense heads where you can have a lot of uh, bad looking leaves and you can eventually strip all that off to get a finished product. Because we have this very delicate and easily controlled environment here, we're able to focus on butterhead and leaf lettuces, things that customers might not necessarily get access to in the store. All right, so we talked about the nutrient film technique with the lettuce on the other side there, which relies on constantly recirculating water. Uh, this is a method developed from the University of Hawaii we're trying out here, which relies on uh, non-recirculating water. So you just fill up the box, 65 gallons of water and your fertilizer, and you wait till the crop is done. These ones are 40 days in and ready to be picked. So some of the benefits of this system are that it doesn't rely on electricity like the other ones where you need pumps and it's a lot less maintenance. You don't need to change your nutrient levels throughout the growth cycle and it's more plug and play. Uh, I can show you here. The roots just essentially dangle in the system and are uh, wicking water as the le level drops in the box. They subsequently uh, compensate for it and drink uh, from the bottom of the box. Okay, so we talked about some of the technological advancements that we're uh, using in this greenhouse here and it's important to notice that uh, this is not the top of the line if you will and there's many professional growers out there that are pushing the limits of yield much farther than us. Um, you know, whether it comes down to supplemental irrigation or you know, precision evapotranspiration irrigation sets uh, there are some improvements that have been made in the industry that we haven't quite caught along with yet and that could uh, essentially push us to the next level in yield per plant. Yeah, there's, there's really all sorts of things, um, as Kieran mentioned. Some of these larger setups will go as far as to inject liquid oxygen into their irrigation line to in increase the amount of soluble oxygen. They're bringing CO2 from some of the petroleum refineries in the Los Angeles uh, area around the port of Long Beach to increase the amount of CO2 to better enhance the plant's ability to photosynthesize and to use nutrients more quickly. Uh, one of the big changes is that we have an acrylic greenhouse, they might have a glass greenhouse, which um, changes the amount of insulation, changes the penetration of light, and so they're getting as close to as possible as an outdoor setting. 
Um, they'll bring in bees for extra pollination. They have all sorts of things going on that there's a lot of marginal improvements in many different areas, but all of these things contribute into a final product that is really high quality. And that's what we're always shooting for here in greenhouse production. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah.